Mic check. Mic check. Oh. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. One, two. Mic check. If we can get everyone to take a seat, Elon will be here in a minute and we're going to have to start. This is great. I'm here today to announce <laughs> Haworth, New Jersey gets special tax cuts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right, all Bergen. <laughs> Thank you. 
We're going to start in one minute, and we are now very crunched for time because of a taxi issue. Um, so we are just going to try to fly through this as quickly as possible. Um, let me know if you have questions about anything. Good? Thank you. In the middle, and Josh in the middle, you can flank him, and then you will come to Tracy and Ashley. Yeah, okay. So let's just do Perfect. the three of us, Thank and then you. warm Tracy up so we can. Yes, I will. Go and ah. stand center. Okay, Alon, he's here. Okay. There we go. No, Alon was at Tracy's wedding. Yeah. Really? Yeah, that's up in the pictures. It's hilarious. Says hi. 
Wait, 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 wait. Okay. He wants. Okay. Here, do this so that we're not. Okay, ready? Okay, we gotta start. Okay, we're no, starting. No, 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 we gotta go. We're starting. Sorry, we're burning this up. Okay, this mic's raining. Okay, we're ready? Okay. We're good. Silence our phones. Okay, good morning. My name is Roberta Abrams, and I am the proud president of the Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. I want to welcome our esteemed guest, Congressman Gottheimer, Elon Carr, dignitaries, elected officials, the press, members of the press, as well as members of Federation's board for joining us today. As one of the state's largest not-for-profit agencies, we represent and serve over 125,000 families in Bergen and Hudson counties, as well as parts of Passaic County. Jewish Federation is the organization in the community dedicated to securing a vibrant Jewish community. We are on the pulse of issues facing our community, and at the same time, we are nimble enough to react and respond where the need is greatest. As an organization, our priorities are often centered on issues of social welfare and identity building. However, over the last 18 months, our energies have shifted to focusing on the safety of the Jewish community. This past school year, there were 15 separate incidents of anti-Semitism in our school, 15. Because of our strong relationships with our law enforcement and our elected officials, Federation is the leading voice and organization called upon to work with local police and school administration to ensure these anti-Semitic situations are being handled swiftly and with the appropriate response. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Congressman Gottheimer for being such an outstanding partner and friend to the Jewish community. We are grateful and look forward to an even stronger working relationship in the future. And now I'd like to introduce Jason Shamus, our CEO. Good morning. Federation is proud to host our friend, Representative Josh Godheimer, Special Envoy Elon Carr, members of the press, and our esteemed group of leaders who are here today. We are especially appreciative, appreciative of the work that all of you do on the matter of combating the increase in, of anti, in anti-Semitism and its effect on our great state. It is not only of tremendous importance to New Jersey's Jewish community of nearly 500,000, but should also be important to all New Jersey state residents who believe in a peaceful and cordial relationship between all of our residents and citizens. The rise in anti-Semitism, hate, and bias incidents in northern New Jersey has reached a near alarming level. As our great American society divides and civil discourse wanes, acts of bias are increasing. We at the Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey have been forced to reprioritize our focus and our resources, whereby our normal course of activity would be to ponder the balance between human and fiscal capital, between social welfare programs and Jewish identity programs for our youth. Today, we are forced more than ever to review safety and security needs and the expenses associated with them. This past spring, Jewish Federation hired a full-time Jewish community security director, Jerry Dargan, back there, a recently retired captain at the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office, has been tasked with coordinating efforts between Jewish communal institutions <clears throat> and the local police departments, as well as to develop training protocols and emergency response procedures. Federation could not achieve all this without the invaluable support we receive from law enforcement and our elected officials. We are proud of the close working relationship we have with Congressman Gottheimer, local law enforcement, and so many other elected officials, of which many are in the room today. The amount of gratitude we owe to our Attorney General, 
Gubrier Graywall, and the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office for their partnership and support is immeasurable. You have all given us hope by being true partners in building a safe and civil state. We are grateful and appreciative of the special bond we share. As Theodore Roosevelt once said, to educate a person in mind and not in morals is to educate a menace to society. So too is our challenge a century later. On behalf of the Jewish community of Northern New Jersey, thank you for your active work in combating hate and bias and your strong commitment to civil discourse and tolerance. Next up is Assemblyman Chris Tully. Good morning. It's an honor to stand here today with so many dignitaries, President Abrams, Congressman Gottheimer, uh, and at the Jewish Federation uh, here in Paramus, a borough I am proud to represent in the New Jersey State Assembly. Uh, it was important for me to be here today, not only to so show support for today's legislation, uh, but as the lone Irish Catholic speaking today, I wanted to show that uh, anti-Semitism is a plague not, us, not just on our Jewish brothers and sisters, uh, but in all of us as a community. Because hate has no home here in New Jersey, here in the United States of America, and it's important that we stand up in one voice to protect and defend uh, our communities that have historically been mistreated and discriminated against. That is why I was proud as an assemblyman to be the prime sponsor of legislation that increased school security funding for our parochial schools that affected so many families and children attending schools in our district. And we also fought to expand security grant funding for our religious institutions in state. Body form of funding was something uh, I was quite used to and I learned firsthand while working as the district director for Congressman Josh Gottheimer. Uh, before uh, ascending to the State Assembly, I had the pleasure of working with Josh and witnessing firsthand his commitment to Israel and our Jewish community. Whether it was standing up to swastikas or hate crimes, whether it was fighting for more funding for religious security and institutions in our district, Congressman Gottheimer has been a strong advocate here, legislatively, in D.C. Uh, there are few champions as strong as Congressman Gottheimer on this issue, and I am proud to call him our friend, and I'm proud to call him our Congressman. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Josh Gottheimer. Thank you, Assemblyman. I appreciate the very kind introduction. Uh, Freeholder, it's very good to see you, Freeholder Zur. Um, Chris, uh, is, you're doing an incredible job. Uh, and I, I really, I think we all uh, would agree that you've, uh, you know, you're now overshadowing us. So well done. Um, and, you know, I really couldn't ask for a better partner in the state legislature. And, and really, your leadership is, is well known. Uh, you've become an incredible champion, not just for your constituents uh, here in Paramus and across your district but also for the issues that, we're, that you're talking about. And, and I think we're all very, very grateful for your leadership, so thank you. Uh, and I am very glad to be here at the Jewish Federation of North Jersey. Uh, Roberta and Jason, thank you so much for what you do every single day and for what the Federation does. It's really uh, um, a remarkable thing that you do for our, for our community, you know, from working with local elected officials and law enforcement to counter anti-Semitism to helping serve and care for seniors and for Holocaust survivors and those with special needs. The Federation is really a tremendous benefit to North Jersey, and I just want to thank you very much for that. <laughs> Rabbi Levy of American Jewish Committee, thank you for being here and for what you do and for all that AGAC does every day. Um, I'm really glad to welcome to New Jersey a very dear friend, uh, my fraternity brother, a uh, longtime leader in the American Jewish community, and of course, beyond anything, a real mensch. Uh, the U.S. United States Special Envoy for Monitoring and Combating Anti-Semitism, Alan Carr. Alan, welcome to New Jersey. Uh, Alan and I are both here today to talk about, as you know, the importance of the fight against anti-Semitism and why we must continue to oppose the Global Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, or BDS, movement, which the House, I'm very pleased to say, after months of discussion and debate, will be voting to uh, uh, stand up against this evening. The United States has a foreign policy interest in monitoring anti-Semitism abroad and in leading other countries to address this global issue. It's why we're going to be voting tonight the way we're going to vote, because this has long been a bipartisan priority. In fact, my friend Republican Congressman Chris Smith of New Jersey actually helped author the provisions that established the special envoy position at the State Department nearly 15 years ago, 
working then with the late Democratic Congressman Tom Lantos, a Holocaust survivor. It was a bipartisan effort uh, then. And when I came to Congress, I immediately joined the Bipartisan Task Force for Combating Anti-Semitism. And for two years, my colleagues and I have urged this administration to fill the special envoy position. I have to say that I believe they made an excellent choice when they picked you. Uh, I was very, very happy about that uh, back in February. Alan and I sat on the AEPI Foundation Board together. We worked hard to combat anti-Semitism on college campuses and across the country and to strengthen the U.S. Israel relationship. And he is already doing an excellent job in leading our fight against bias, hatred, and intolerance on the world stage. His appointment sends a strong message about our government's commitment to fighting anti-Semitism globally. Personally, I believe we need to give the Special Envoy's office all the backing and support we can, which is why I've also co-sponsored bipartisan legislation to elevate the Special Envoy position to the rank of ambassador. Um, and I hope that that becomes law. I know you can't get involved in that, but I can advocate for it. To put it lightly, I think it's fair to say that we are living in tumultuous times. I think that's a light statement compared to what we're living through and with anti-Semitism on the rise at home and around the world. As the ADL has reported, anti-Semitism in the United States <laughs> remains at near historic levels in 2018. ADL's annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents recorded a total of 1,879 attacks against Jews and Jewish institutions in 2018, the third highest year on record since the ADL started rec recording this data in the 1970s. And physical assaults on Jews more than doubled over the previous year. It's why my office has work been working so closely with great partners, partners like the Federation, the New Jersey Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, and many faith leaders to push for more resources from the nonprofit security grant program to get back to Jersey, clawing more than 1.8 million to the district from Washington, an increase of 260% from the year before, to make sure that our synagogues and yeshivas and Jewish community centers and all of our houses of worship are protected from new and increasing threats of terror. As you know, if you read the paper, it's in our schools, it's on campaign signs, it's increasingly found in the public debate. In recent months, swastikas or other anti-Semitic slurs have been found in the front of a home in Teaneck, at schools in Glenrock, in Ridgewood, in Emerson, and the Pascack Valley. That matches the national trend in which K-12 schools surpassed public areas as the locations with the most anti-Semitic incidents in 2017. Schools more than, again, <coughs> public areas. We've also seen growing numbers of incidents on college campuses. It's alarming and we must all act. I have voted several times this Congress to reaffirm our commitment to fighting anti-Semitism in all forms of bigotry, co-sponsoring the Never Again Education Act, bipartisan legislation to help fund programs to teach children about the Holocaust in our schools, co-sponsoring the Securing American Nonprofit Organizations Against Terrorism Act, which would authorize investment in the nonprofit security grant program, which we just discussed. And last year, the President signed into law the Protecting Religiously Affiliated Institutions Act, legislation I co-sponsored to criminalize new threats against schools and Jewish community centers. We're also here today, however, beyond the United States, to talk about the increasing and alarming incidents, not just here, but around the world. It's an alarming and increasing trend, and I'm sure the Special Envoy will discuss that. In recent years, we have seen anti-Semitism and xenophobia rise in many other parts of the world, again, at an alarming rate. Earlier, th earlier this year, thousands of Jews rallied in Paris to protest a rise in anti-Semitism, including the vandalism of a centuries-old Jewish cemetery in which nearly 100 homes were spray-painted with blue swastikas. In Europe, far-right parties like the extremist Alternative for Germany Party, AFD, continued to make gains in movements across the continent. In Pol and co across the continent. In Poland, for instance, the ruling Law and Justice Party sought to criminalize mentioning the Polish nation in any recounting of the history or memory of the Holocaust. We're talking about in 2019. In Britain, more than a dozen lawmakers have resigned from the Labor Party in disgust with the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn and the failure to address anti-Semitism within the party's ranks, which is now being investigated by the UK's Equality and Human Rights Commission. We must continue to rededicate ourselves to addressing this scourge in all forms, to never forget, but more, to never accept. Never accept hatred, bigotry, and anti-Semitism in all and any form. That's why I've spoken out so strongly here in my community and repeatedly in the halls of Congress. Because one-off incidents become trends, which turn into accepted behavior. And if we are not vigilant, turn even more evil and violent. A report released just this month from the EU's Fundamental Rights 
agency found that half of young Jewish Europeans had been the victim of at least one anti-Semitic incident in the past year. Young Jews in Europe feel they are blamed by people in their countries for the actions of the Israeli government simply because they are Jewish. 85% said this happens to them at least occasionally. Nearly one quarter said it occurs all the time. It's why synagogues are now behind hidden doors in many places in Europe, unmarked. Jews are afraid to wear the Star of David around their necks. And more observant Jews are told not to wear yarmulkes or kippahs in public. I co-sponsored the Bipartisan Combating European Anti-Semitism Act, which was signed into law in January, in part because of these alarming facts. Furthermore, while most Jews do not believe the criticism of Israel is by itself anti-Semitic, they believe it becomes so when manifested in certain ways, including 70% who say that boycotts of Israel or Israelis are indeed anti-Semitic. Like that of all nations, Israel's leadership is not perfect. And I certainly disagree with some of its decisions. Look, there will always be legitimate policy differences. I get that. But we should refuse to accept the smear that Israel is an apartheid state or the idea that freedom of speech affords people the right to harass Jewish students. We must not allow false claims about Israel's human rights record to be accepted, particularly given Israel's location in a region in which women and members of the LGBTQ community are often denied fundamental rights. Likewise, we cannot allow attacks on Israel to be used as a smokescreen for anti-Semitism. There's, of course, nothing wrong with having a robust debate about our foreign policy, as I said, but that debate veers into something much darker when there is talk of dual loyalty or other ancient tropes. These are not legitimate opinions about our foreign policy. We've often seen such anti-Semitic tropes and rhetoric when it comes to the global BDS movement. BDS inherently denies the Jewish people's 3,000-year-old connection to the land of Israel, while seeking to delegitimize Israel and deny its right to exist as a Jewish state. BDS also makes it more difficult to achieve a lasting two-state solution by singling out only one side of the conflict for blame. That's why 346 members of the U.S. House of Representatives have co-sponsored a bipartisan resolution to oppose the boycott of Israel and support a two-state solution. And that's what we're voting on this evening. Members of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus, which I co-chair, have strongly supported this resolution. We believe in the historic bipartisan U.S.-Israel relationship because our countries share common interests and fundamental values, and we understand that a strong relationship is very important to America's national security. In fact, Israel and New Jersey our sister states, which trade more than $1.3 billion annually. We're also very proud that Americans freely hold many different opinions about our foreign policy. That's why nothing in this resolution that we're voting on tonight prevents anyone in any way from being able to express themselves to engage in free speech. But we also continue working hard across the aisle to reject biased, divisive, and discriminatory efforts to single out and delegitimize Israel. No modern de democracy should be singled out in this way especially not our key democratic ally in a region surrounded by organizations and enemies of the United States, including Hamas and Hezbollah and Pidge and ISIS and others. The scourge of anti-Semitism has infected human societies for centuries. It's the hatred of Jews drawn from simple words and ideas and stories, which has led to violent pogroms, the slaughter of six million Jews in the Holocaust, the murder of 11 Americans praying in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, and the April shooting at a synagogue in California. We cannot allow these ideas to fester, to go unchecked, or to be further embraced either at home or abroad. We must continue to act to address anti-Semitism whenever and wherever we see it, from the left or from the right. When we let people spew hatred, when we let other countries around the world turn a blind eye to rising anti-Semitism, we let our fundamental values slip away. Because anti-Semitism isn't the only ism affecting our society. We have seen attempts to point fingers using racist dog whistle language in recent days. You don't tell Americans to go back to where they came from. That's unacceptable. And when white supremacists and neo-Nazis feel they can openly chant, Jews will not replace us, as they did in Charlottesville in 2017, we have an alarming problem. I supported the legislation condemning all forms of discrimination, and I condemn the tweets for a simple reason. Because it's the reason we're here today. It's the reason we must stand strong against all forms of hatred. We must not allow it. It's against our values. And anti-Semitism is a distinct problem that transcends race and ideology, with anti-Semites found on the extreme right and on the extreme left and in the center. It's found among people from all backgrounds. Its origins go back thousands of years with the enslavement of Jews, the restriction of Jews to the Holocaust with the murder of six million, restriction of Jews, and then, of course, the murders 
of six million Jews and others in the Holocaust. Today, groups like Hezbollah and Hamas threaten the right of Israel to exist with the rhetoric and with their rockets. For these reasons, a boycott in Israel is not just bad policy, but is morally wrong and furthers anti-Semitism rather than helps defeat it. Israel must not be singled out for such a discriminatory policy. Finally, the, research, the recent resurgence of nativism only underscores the vital importance of the special envoy's mandate and the urgency of our need to combat global anti-Semitism and all forms of bigotry, hatred, and intolerance. Because here in the greatest country in the world, we must heed Anne Frank's words. Despite everything, I believe that people are really good at heart. I am very proud to introduce to you a man of good heart, my friend, Special Envoy Alankar. My goodness, that was, what an asset you are. We're lucky to have you. Um, my friends, it is a thrill and a pleasure to be back in New Jersey, my second home, I can say that, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, because uh, as a New Yorker, I spent uh, a lot of time in the tri-state area, including here in Bergen County where my grandparents lived. I spent many weekends in Englewood, and so it's good to be back. I also never say no to Federation. And uh, this is probably my seventh, eighth Federation event because, you know, when it comes to, uh, to Tikkun Olam, when it comes to, uh, to fixing our world, not only uh, fixing the Jewish people, but our communities and our country, uh, nobody does it better. And uh, when you look at the over billion dollars raised and spent on charities around the country, uh, federations uh, do it better than anybody. And so I want to thank... Uh, our great leaders, Roberta and Jason, for everything you do uh, for, uh, for New Jersey and, and for our communities. Um, AJC is here, and, uh, and AJC, you should know, is really one of my go-to addresses whenever, um, whenever I, I begin a diplomatic visit overseas. Uh, the work that they do here in the United States and in countries around the world uh, on the issue of anti-Semitism, among others, is, uh, is truly extraordinary. So I want to thank AJC. Um, it is a, a thrill to be here in the district of dear friends, and uh, I, I first of all have to begin with uh, with my fraternity brother uh, Josh Gottheimer, who is uh, who is a gift to the United States, and uh, and to causes that all of us hold so dear. I'm so proud of you and of everything you do, and uh, and really uh, uh, now in my current role, what a what a pleasure it is to to be your partner and work together to make our country better and to protect the Jewish people. And, uh, and then uh, a freeholder, Tracy Zor, uh, whom I've known for only 30 years, that's all. And uh, I was at their wedding, and, uh, and we're, we're old friends. And so it's a thrill. And I want to also acknowledge uh, Assemblyman Tully, who's here, and thank you for your leadership. Uh, remarkably enough, it is less than 75 years since the crematoria of Europe stopped operating. And yet, we meet at a time of rising anti-Semitism throughout the world. In Europe, in Latin America, in the Middle East, and even in the most philo-Semitic country in the history of the world, even the United States is not immune. We see Jews attacked on the streets of Europe. We see vandalism of Jewish properties in Europe, in Brooklyn, in Los Angeles. We see literally textbooks inculcating hatred in children in countries that are allies of the United States. Social media boiling over with Jew hatred. And then, of course, murder. Murder in Western Europe not too long ago, and again even here. Jews on Shabbat in synagogue murdered in Pittsburgh and Poway. I spoke at the funeral of Lori Kay, of blessed memory. And what I said then, on behalf not only of my department, the Department of State, but on behalf of the entire administration, is that we are at war with these people. And the sources of anti-Semitism are all equally vile. The sources are the ethnic supremacist far right, the Israel-hating radical left, and militant Islam. By the way, three sources, 
three groups that should hate each other more than they hate anything else on earth and yet are united by their hatred of the Jewish people and I would argue by something else as well and that is by the fundamental incompatibility of their values with everything on which our country was built and so what I said at the funeral of Laurie Kay is we are at war with the ethnic supremacist far right that took her life just as we are at war with the other sources of anti-Semitism. We don't rank them. We don't preference them. And it is the policy of the United States that Jew hatred is Jew hatred. And we will combat it whether it is dressed in the ideology of the far right, of the far left, or militant Islam. Now, I will tell you that in my diplomatic visits overseas, I have been to eight countries now, Eastern and Central Europe, where I confronted the problem of the ethnic supremacist far right, political parties, not in government, but political parties that are unvarnished and open in their hatred of the Jewish people. I was just in the UK, just returned from London, where, as our congressman mentioned, uh, the Labour Party is boiling over and, and, and multiple members of, of the House of Lords and the House of Commons are resigning because they will not sit at the same table with anti-Semites. That's in their words. And here in the United States, here in the United States, we hear rhetoric and language in places that would have been unthinkable just a few years ago that raises concern in all of us. And this is something that we all have to confront together. What I want to say a few words about is the kind of anti-Semitism that today is sweeping the world, sweeping Western Europe, and sweeping the halls of academia in the United States. It is often called the new anti-Semitism, and this is the anti-Semitism that clothes itself in the fig leaf of Israel hatred and anti-Zionism. It's called the new anti-Semitism but I'm here to tell you there is nothing new about it. In fact, every single classic manifestation of anti-Semitism is duplicated precisely in the so-called new anti-Semitism. Medieval blood libels claiming through the centuries that Jews bake matzah with the blood of children. Well, the new anti-Semitism is wrapped in blood libels, accusing the Jew among the countries of perpetrating genocide of being an apartheid regime, even of infecting Palestinian children with viruses. So you have the same blood libels. You also have the same rhetoric. A Jewish leader in Europe was recently called a dirty Zionist, as though the substitution of a word might confuse us as to what is actually meant. My own grandfather in Iraq was arrested when my mother was a very young girl, dragged through the streets in leg irons and thrown in prison. But before he was thrown in prison, he was tried for being a Zionist. What did that mean? He was accused of, of handing out Zionist propaganda at a rally in Baghdad, putting aside the question of whether that should be a crime. He wasn't in Baghdad. And when his case was called, he said to the judge, Your Honor, I'll bring witnesses. I was working with British officers in the port of Basra that day. I wasn't in Baghdad. The judge said, you're challenging the accusation against you for you two years above the sentence already decided. So it wasn't about him being at a rally. It wasn't about Zionist material. It was about him being a Jew. That's what Zionist means. As our Consul General here, Consul General Dayan, a great leader here in this region, said, the Israel haters have turned Zionism into a four-letter word. Same rhetoric then with the old anti-Semitism, same rhetoric now. Similarly, the isolation of the Jewish people, the Jewish outsider in the community, menacing, ominous, threatening. So too, in the new anti-Semitism, is the Jew among the countries isolated and demonized. The same also is the obsessive, pathological obsession on this hatred. Just as in the old anti-Semitism, we see it again 
in the obsessive pathological focus on the one Jewish state. An American student at a top prestigious university gave me a, an answer sheet in his math class. I still have a copy. It says the derivative of so-and-so is such-and-such, the integral of such-and-such -such is so-and-so, and then it says another day in the occupied Palestinian territories, Zionist forces murdering children. Then it goes to math. The kid who gave this to me in a voice reflecting nothing other than exhaustion said to me, in math class I can't even run away from this? Even in math class? That's right even in math class, because like the old anti-Semitism, the so-called new anti-Semitism is just as obsessive, just as compulsive. So too with the economic suffocation of the Jewish people. We all have seen those pictures of brown shirts holding signs in front of Jewish shops, Kauft nicht bei Juden. And today, as the congressman mentioned so well, we have the global BDS movement seeking to suffocate the Jewish state economically, denying the Jew among the countries economic intercourse that everyone else can enjoy. That's what the BDS movement is. It is seeking to deny the Jew economic transactions. That is anti-Semitism, pure and simple. Lastly, a commonality with the old and the new anti-Semitism is blaming the Jew for the anti-Semitic hatred of the Jew. This is classic, nothing new here. In fact, even Kristallnacht was blamed on, in that case, a real event. No blood and matzah this time. The assassination of a German diplomat by Herschel Greenspan, a Jew. But just because the Nazis claimed that Kristallnacht was a response to an event that a Jew did, doesn't mean we're so gullible as to believe that that's really the case. We understand that Kristallnacht was part of the agenda, the strategy of the Nazis to destroy the Jewish people. So too in the new anti-Semitism, just because the Israel haters claim that their obsession with Israel is a response to something Israel did, fictionally or actually, a building project here, a military operation there, doesn't mean that we're so gullible as to believe that that really is why they hit Israel. We understand that this obsession with Israel is part of the strategy of delegitimizing and isolating and ultimately destroying the one Jewish state in the world. And so, my friends, it is the policy of the United States that we will fight this scourge everywhere and anywhere it rears its ugly head. Whether that's here at home, whether that's in Europe, whether that's in Latin America, where rabbis have been attacked on the streets, and whether that is in the Middle East, where anti-Semitism is alive and well, again, even in some countries that are strong allies of ours. But what I want to leave you with is this, on a positive note, is we have real cause for optimism here. Because we have assets in this fight, real assets in this fight, that are incredibly important. And that I believe will turn the tide, not just to contain this metastatic cancer, but to roll it back. Asset number one is this administration, committed in unprecedented fashion to the fight against anti-Semitism, to the protection of the Jewish people throughout the world, and to support for the State of Israel. That's not only my boss, Secretary Pompeo, but that's President Trump and Vice President Pence and National Security Advisor Bolton, and of course the New Jersey boys, uh, Jason Greenblatt and, and others who are, who are committed uh, in, to an extent that we simply have never seen before to this fight. Asset number two, is that because anti-Semitism is so open and notorious, leaders throughout the world, non-Jewish leaders, understand that they are in the fight for their lives, not only for Jewish lives. And they stand up with eloquence and passion, and they say, this is a disgrace, and we've got to fight this. And what they also say is that this isn't only about protecting Jews, although that would be reason enough to do it. 
This is about the future of our country, the future of our continent, the future of our communities. Because the history of anti-Semitism is that it is the world's greatest barometer of human suffering. President Trump calls it a vile poison. It is, because every society that imbibes it rots to its core. And our leaders understand that. We heard that precisely from Assemblyman Tully, who said that anti-Semitism destroys us all. It's not just about the Jews. And he's not alone. I'm happy to report that leaders throughout the world at all levels, from heads of state and government to ministers to, to parliamentarians and to local mayors, all get it and are saying it. And that's a huge asset. And asset number three are people like Josh Gottheimer. Let me tell you something about Josh. You know, he has been absolutely, that, that means I need to call my son before he leaves for school. Um, he has been not just an ally on this issue. He's been a champion of this issue. There is nobody who is more eloquent, more determined, and who leads more effectively on this issue. And that's why when I had the chance to come here and, and speak at this event, I didn't walk, I ran. Now, let me tell you something, whether it comes to, to calling out and recognizing the importance of monitoring anti-Semitism in Europe, calling out the vile global BDS movement for what it is, supporting the state of Israel, calling out anti-Semitism here in the United States, through his legislation and through his eloquence, he makes a difference every single day. And he makes this fight a fight that we can win. Also for support for the state of Israel. He's been a leader on ballistic missile defense for the state of Israel, whether it's Arrow 3 or David Sling or Iron Dome. His leadership literally has saved lives. Literally, you've saved lives. And that is extraordinary. And I just couldn't be prouder. I was proud enough when you got elected. But now that I've seen what you've done, there are no words. And there, there's no way that, that I or anybody devoted to the fight against anti-Semitism can express fully our gratitude to you. I also want to say something outside of my portfolio. At a time of of heartbreaking polarization in our country today. The fact that Congressman Gottheimer has been such a leader on bipartisanship, not only on the issue of anti-Semitism in Israel, on every issue, by co-chairing the Problem Solvers Caucus, he is making a difference on one of the most critical issues facing our country. You know, the Jewish people understand the dangers of gratuitous hatred among citizenry. We have, have a word for it, sinat chinam. And as we approach Tisha B'Av, the commemoration of the destruction and loss of sovereignty in Jerusalem, we know and we learn that it was Sinat Chinam that cost the Jewish people sovereignty in Israel. And as our country is polarized and fractured, to have leaders who stand up and say enough is enough, we're going to work together to solve our problems and move our country forward is a gift. And so for all of those reasons, I want to say, Josh, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. And I have no doubt that you will make the world a better place. Please know that in your great work, you have no greater admirer than I and no more loyal partner than I. I look forward to working with you and, uh, and truly doing tikkun olam b'malchut shaddai, repairing our world and making our country better. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Before you leave, because you're leaving right now. Sorry, if I don't make my train, I'm dead. I've got a bill on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to vote on that. I literally have a bill on the floor, and if I don't make my train, I'm dead. But if, can I call you? Can I talk to you after? Is that okay? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, just a question. Uh, we can get you. questions through me. Uh, sorry. Thank um, you. I can take a few questions, okay. sure. So um, you spoke of all the anti Semitism that's happening overseas in Europe. Um, we see the violence, we see this on the streets. 
countries, at what point does the United States step in uh, to avoid something like the Holocaust happening again? At what point do you say, okay, now it's time to act? Well, we are. I mean, we, we, we have stepped in. Uh, I, I can tell you that when I go overseas, um, I'm not only representing, uh, you know, my parochial office, but I have the full support of Secretary Pompeo, who could not possibly be more committed to this. I and mean, we are blessed to have a Secretary of State who, who is this, you know, determined to fight anti-Semitism and to promote religious freedom. Uh, by the way, we just hosted at the Department of State a... Um, a ministerial uh, with uh, well over a hundred countries participating at ministerial level, or close to ministerial level, uh, all about uh, the need to promote religious freedom and anti-Semitism played a prominent role in that. And so he is committed to this. When I go overseas, every leader with whom I meet understands that this isn't just my message. This is something about which my boss and his boss really care and really mean what they say. You know, when the president spends time at the State of the Union address talking about anti-Semitism, the world notices. We really care about this. And, and so, you know, when I have specific requests of our allies, um, and also compliments, you know, I, a, lot of, a lot of our friends and allies around the world are doing great things. And, I, and part of my job is not only to, to pressure the recalcitrant, it's also to support with the full weight of the United States those friends and allies who are fighting this fight. And we have many of them. And so when I go overseas, uh, uh, we do make a difference, and, uh, and that is because of uh, the commitment of the administration to that. And so we are stepping in, we will step in, and uh, we will continue to fight this fight. Um, nobody talked about what many feel is anti-Semitism in the Democrat Party and the silence of the party, <clears throat> uh, specifically Congresswoman Omar and Tlaib. Those names were not mentioned at this press conference. Um, why? And well, what I said was, what I said was that anti-Semitism is a global problem. We see it everywhere in the world. We see it in Europe. We see it in the United States. We see it in Latin America. We see it in the Middle East. Uh, we also see it in places that we wouldn't expect to find it. Uh, to single out one particular kind of it or one brand of it, I think does disservice to the global fight. Uh, like I said, we don't rank anti-Semitism. We don't preference it. Jew hatred is Jew hatred. We have to fight it anywhere and everywhere it appears. And that's our job. That's what we do. And I will continue to do just that. Well, if I may just follow up, uh, people don't hesitate to call President Trump a racist, uh, practically on a daily basis, by name. Um, so again, I, I ask again, why the reluctance to call out people by name, if that's what they're doing, in the opinion of some people, that's what they are, that's what they're doing? Well, again, about President Trump, you couldn't have a stronger ally to fight this fight than President Trump, who is... Uh, passionate about this and who is, is, is supporting not only the state of Israel but the Jewish community uh, in this country. I'll r remind everyone that after, after the massacre at, at Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue at a Make, a Great Amer Make America Great Again rally in Illinois, President Trump said something that perhaps is unprecedented in history for a world leader to say. He said, if you seek the destruction of the Jews, we will seek your destruction. This is the President of the United States saying, you go after the Jews, we're coming after you. That is extraordinary, and it's unprecedented. And so President Trump is, is, uh, is uh, a, a, an extraordinary ally and a leader, um, the leader of, of our fight against anti-Semitism. Um, and again, we don't, we don't rank kinds of anti-Semitism. We fight it all. We don't preference it. And I will continue to do that as the President and Secretary Pompeo have instructed me to do. Well, we, we do every day. It's what, it's what I do. And not just I, I mean, but, but Secretary of State does this, the Vice President does this. I mean, we, we uh, keep this issue on the front burner. And I will tell you, you know, when I go overseas, it's not just to, to make a visit or give speeches. I have bilateral diplomatic meetings with, with leaders at a senior level, uh, including, including heads of government. I've met with prime ministers. I certainly meet with ministers. And, uh, and we make specific requests. And I'm happy to report that uh, my requests, even though they're sometimes very big asks, 
they're taken very seriously. And when I say that the United States really cares about this and we have a problem with something, um, countries often respond with, with you know, we will, we will see what we can do to fix it. And so that's, uh, I'm very, very grateful, very grateful that, that, um, that our leaders around the world understand. By the way, it's not only because the United States cares. Let me be clear about it. Leaders around the world, like I said before, are looking around them and are shocked that anti-Semitism is on the rise, especially in Europe. And they genuinely want to fight it. So it's not like, well, I'm twisting their arms. I'm not twisting their arms. They're willing allies and partners. And we will continue to support our friends and allies that are doing the right thing. Thank you all very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again in New Jersey.